You're now watching the lifestyle segment on the weekend show brought to you by Holy Crunch Popcorn. Hello, Didi. Hi, Andy. How was your week? Eventful. I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> what stood out for you? Um, social media. You know, I learned a lot. Good or a bad? Lot. Bad, actually. Bad concerning the Nigerian music industry. Yeah. So I learned a lot of negative things. I don't know. You know, we listen to music, and um, in this part of the world, we enjoy the beats more than the lyrics. And um, someone would be crying out in their lyrics, and then all we hear is what the producer is giving us the beats, and that's what we dance to. Or we we joke about everything. Absolutely. Everything is a joke. And that's why I mentioned Omale earlier. Mm -hmm. This guy has said his music has been depressed so many times. Mm -hmm. It's driven his music. You hear the lyrics, but what do we do? We dance. Exactly. So that's an IRS one thousand. We joke about. It. There's uh -huh. a skit. Mobad sadly is passing. You'll see a skit next week. And that's why sometimes the other people don't take us serious. But my biggest problem is how it affects our well being. And like you said about social media, I don't want to call it the noise, but the amount of information which we saw out there got me quite worried. Yeah. Which is why we're talking about suicide and suicide prevention. And the key thing about suicide is that. People don't realize it takes 100,000, 800,000 lives globally. Every 40 seconds, one person commits suicide. And if you look at that in aggregate, that's higher than HIV and AIDS. That's higher than malaria. That's higher than war and famine. So we look at the war in Russia and Ukraine, but we don't realize more people are dying because they kill them all, take their own lives than through all these other wars and things like that. It's tragic. So in Nigeria, is one of the epicenters of suicide, unfortunately. Uh, globally, we're ranked the 15th in terms of suicide. And then in Africa, we're the seventh. So if we want to think about public health, if we want to think about saving people's lives, because every life is important, we need to make sure that we give people the tools for suicide prevention and make sure that people know that there's hope out there. In the United States, for instance, a lot of people are locked up in prison as a result of drug usage. What about the impact which it has on their lives? Is it a medical condition or is it criminal? In Nigeria, the National Drug Law Enforcement Agency is currently and constantly arresting and prosecuting people for possession and sale of illegal drugs, which is right and within their mandate. But how does this affect people? What about the stigma? Statistics show in Nigeria that for every seven people, that one person has used drugs in the last one year. And for every five people using drugs, one has a substance use disorder. For every four people, with substance use disorder, one is a woman. And statistics show that women go faster from casual drug usage to problematic drug usage, because most times when women use drugs, they tend to use it with multiple partners, especially when they inject the drugs. And when it now comes to treatment, the statistics on treatment that was conducted in about 70 something treatment centers in Nigeria shows that for every 20 people that access treatment to substance use disorder, only one is a woman. So now, what are the, why is the only one that's a woman? Because of stigma. Women face double stigma. They face stigma from their caregivers, stigma from the health workers, and even after they assess the treatment, when it comes back into reintegration, back into the society, they also face this type of stigma. Happy fifth anniversary to the weekend show, Didi. Oh yes, happy fifth anniversary, Andy. How excited are you about the anniversary or about the food which we've got behind? Both, actually. I'm excited about both the food and the anniversary. It's really, five years is a lot. It is a lot. Yeah, at five, I was in primary one, so that's <laughs> a lot. <laughs> yeah, five years you know, is a lot. I remember watching Ryan Seacrest once, and I had seen, he had this um, daily show, which he had done for 10 years. Mm. And in my head, I was like, how do you do this every day for 10 years? But look at us, five, five years, years down already. the line. <laughs> We have done that. A lot of Nigerians have been reported to migrate illegally um, for greener pastures because of the poverty in the land, amongst others. Just a couple of days, four Nigerians were found on the route of a ship in Brazil, and they have two have been returned, while two are seeking asylum. So this is a big problem. Why do we have these issues, and what can we do? Because the theme is about leaving no one behind. We'll be having a conversation about that, and joining us today we have... We have Lauren De Book, who is the Chief of Mission, IOM Nigeria. Good morning and welcome to the show. Good morning. So what is the current situation with illegal migration in Nigeria and trafficking? That's a question which I would love having uh, the, the answer. By a sense, because it's irregular, we don't know. 
So we only know a portion, which is those which can be intercepted or who decide to actually stop this cycle of migration. Uh, for Nigeria, we have supported in the last four years more than 31,000 people. But, but if I say that, it doesn't reflect the reality at all. It's only those who have been uh, sto stopped uh, or stopped themselves. So we went to one of our office, in offices in the world and said, I need, I need help because I have been abused, I've, uh, I've paid a lot of money and I never reached my place. And, and I'm talking about those who are smuggled. Then we have those who are trafficked, because there is a nuance. It's, it means that they have been abused um, and uh, exploited, um, women, girls, boys and, and men. For those, we, we, I, I just looked at the statistics in, the, in West Africa, uh, we have, for the last 25 years, assisted 100,000 people trafficked. It means 10 per day. So, and that's West Africa. Then we have people of Nigeria coming from uh, the Middle East. Well, a month ago, we supported a woman who, who escaped and, and uh, came back from the Emirates here. But she mentioned that there are tens of uh, similar situations there still, but they can't escape. She came with people. Welcome back. You're now on the breakfast segment of the weekend show where we address the most important thing after a good life, which is good food. As usual, we have our returning chef, our resident chef of the month, Chef yes. Goodness in the house. Good morning. good morning. Welcome back to the weekend show. Thank you. Very chef very Goodness, much. whenever I see you in the <laughs> studio, I'm always happy. There's this song that always comes to my mind. Goody, goody. <laughs> <laughs> so welcome back. Thank so you. So can you tell me all that is going on here? Because there's so much. There's starters. There's main dish. There's desserts. There's drinks. Yes. There's fruits. Yes. Can you tell us about all of these, please? Okay. Um, good food is good health. Mm -hmm. When you eat a right food, it keeps you going. And good food is good business. Yes, it's well. also a good <laughs> business, my dear. So we have a lot of dishes here. Mm -hmm. and they're all healthy and they are all in a given proportion. Right. So when you talk about what is balanced diet, balanced diet is a combination of all the classes of food coming together in a given proportion. Right. Even in how some people are not eating 110 again, uh, 110. Yeah. Some now is only zero, zero, 001. Yeah which is so some bad. Is zero, zero, half. <laughs> honestly, go to the hospital, you see young children, right. Honestly, right. sometimes they will knock at the gate. Can I get something to give my children that they have not eaten since the whole day? So right. food is, uh, is life because if you are not fasting and praying, that one is a different thing. Yeah. But if you have not eaten for the whole day, I think the person, the person needs to eat and eat a healthy thing. Thank Good you so much, Chef us. Goodness. Thank and you, I also love chef. the fact that you always give us balanced meals here. The yes. proteins are covered, the mm. carbohydrates, the vegetables, yes. the fruit. You don't, yeah. oh, you don't play with that. Yes, you make sure it. you always give us fruit and vegetables yes. with every meal. Yes. said before, today is celebration. I came to celebrate. Mm -hmm. can see all my we wine. can see champagne. All the champagnes. <laughs> yeah, I went for West African Food Festival of the year Nigerian hosted last year we were, we were in Ghana and then Nigerian won so we hosted this year and we have over 15 African countries mm -hmm. that were around and out of all the competitions Chef Rudy mm -hmm. got three medals Woof, and, and an award, an award. So tell um, us about the medals. What what categories did yeah. you win and what's the mm -hmm. award about? You can see this one is uh, the winner Superwoman. Then about the food, we're so excited. I almost forgot about the food. Mm -hmm. What do we have going on on this table? And one thing I like about you, Chef Rudy, is that you give us a three-course meal. <laughs> you cover everything from the appetizers to the main dish and to the desserts, mm -hmm. down to the juices, the fruits and vegetables. And can you tell us a little bit about what is going on yes, on this table? Yes, I made. I particularly made my signature coconut rice mm -hmm. today because if if I I don't know why. You eat coconut rice and you don't have a feel that you're eating coconut rice. So with my signature coconut rice, you are going to feel the coconuts. coconuts. When, it, when it comes to cooking, I just like to take my time and do a lot of research. And this is my signature coconut, coconut rice. rice. When you feel it, you feel the flavor, the, the creamy the, and the flaky part of the coconuts. 
that's mm -hmm. what you have there. Then I made the um, Ntokon pasta, Ntokon creamy pasta. That's okay. also my signature that sounds pasta. Interesting. Yes, with meatballs. Wow. And I made my jollof rice, the regular jollof rice with some do, uh, oh, wishy -wishy. Do -wishy -wishy <laughs> goat's meat sauce. Okay. So we have here our fresh juice. Okay. The fresh juice is made from apples and um, um, sweet melon, mm -hmm. just apples and sweet melon. And we have here, this is so filling. We made it from banana. We made a banana with some nuts, almond it's nuts. A smoothie. Yes, yes, it's Amazing. a smoothie. Ah, oh, Chef Alatu, I have there's there's so much going on on this table. I can see different types of cookies and pastries. There's chocolate. There's this one that looks like strawberry. Can you please tell us what's going on? Because I don't even I can't <laughs> even grasp what's what we have here. There's so many vi varieties of cookies and pastries. Please, can you explain? Please? All right, let's start with this. Okay. Now these are cherry filled strawberry cookies. Strawberry cookies. Mm -hmm. This is a vanilla with sprinkles. Mm -hmm. and these are shortbread cookies. This is chocolate cookies. And these are coconut filled cookies. And these are plain vanilla cookies. Why these are just uh, cut out vanilla cookies. Wow. So on on an unrelated note, how have you been coping with the current increase? Because I heard the price of flour now goes for as high as $65,000 yeah, for a sugar. bag. So how have you been coping with the inflation, with the, the, the prices of your your ingredients and your products. Do you have to increase the price of your products or some people have to reduce the quantity in order to stabilize? So how do you do that? Okay, as you know, there's no party without a cake. Mm -hmm. So if a customer comes in or a client comes in, we'll tell you what the market is saying. So it's not left for you to choose. Either you want to go for the same big one you've been going for or a lesser one. Price. Now watching the Climate Chat segment of the weekend show and I welcome you to the very first episode and say thank you once again for joining. The Climate Chat will weekly look at issues affecting um, climate um, the communities you know, in Nigeria as per climate disasters and how this affects gender inequalities or how it expands inequalities across the board. And this morning, as we look forward to celebrating International Day of the Girl Child, we'll be taking a very quick look at how flooding has impacted the Nigerian girl child across several communities in Nigeria. According to Malala Fund, um, it is estimated that by 2025, 12.5 million children, girl child will be out of school as a result of flooding. I really just want you to talk to us this morning about if climate we keep saying the Nigerian girl child, but there are also boys living in these communities. Would you say that, as someone who has worked in many of these communities, would you say that climate affects the Nigerian girl child differently from the boy child? Um, over the years, we've worked with these communities, and I, I tell you that um, climate change affects people disproportionately. And um, the girl child is one of the, uh, the group that climate change has impacted so much negatively. Um, the effect of climate change on the girl child has spread so much that it affects them socially. It affects them even um, their education. Um, say, for instance, um, they're, 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 they're flooding around everywhere. And, um, you know, as a girl child born into a home in Nigeria, you already have a lot of responsibility for just being a girl child. So um, climate change just um, adds to the number of responsibilities you have as a girl child. COP28 kicked off on November 30th, 2023 in the United Arab Emirates as world leaders, uh, sustainable business and environmental stakeholders, amongst other activists, gather to discuss global climate change consequences and the solutions for a more sustainable world. But the big question is that when COP28 ends on December 12th, what would this mean for climate justice, especially here in Nigeria? So... Um, this year is not so different. Nigeria has been participating for a year, but this year we want to see more of um, commitment turn into action. We want to see more investments in clean energy from the government and let that energy transition into sustainable actions for um, the energy poverty gap. We want to see more focus on 
women and girls and how their specific challenges can be met. I really just want to know what commitments and pledges were made by the Nigerian government. What did they sign to? What did they say they were going to do when they come back to Nigeria? And how can we as a people hold them accountable? Regarding the numbers of Nigeria delegates uh, at COP, but of course, I think uh, there was a clarification on that. Um, Nigeria said they sponsored only 422 delegate, delegations to COP, and that's fine. But um, um, an important thing that actually came out from, from COP28 is the fact that world leaders agreed to say we are transiting away from fossil fuel. And um, although Nigeria is saying that we are not in the game of saying we want to face out for C4. A very good morning to you. Welcome back. I'm Tende Chimeliu, and you're now on the Entrepreneur Spotlight on the weekend show. Sickle cell disease is a hereditary blood disorder that causes pain, organ damage, and a shorter life expectancy. Although it is primarily affected by people of African descent, it can affect anyone. Advances in treatment and increased awareness are crucial steps towards improving the lives of those battling with sickle cell. We also offer prenatal care for people at risk of bearing affected offspring, mm -hmm. and over time we've been able to do a lot of that. Because pageants can be seen as, as um, presenting harmful um, body standards and can be also seen as controversial due to their, their focus on, on the female appearance. So what would you say to those who argue that, that pageantry is, is too, um, quote unquote, immoral? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so now this is what I would say. You know how they say, train a woman, you train a nation, right? give a woman an opportunity, you give a nation an opportunity. And I feel a whole lot of that literally lies on the responsibility that the pageant industry has. And this is the sense I look at it as, as it is normal, right? In a situation where you have um, women, not just any type of woman, beautiful, brilliant, well-spoken women, the men will follow. Good morning, beautiful people. It's Aisha B here. Welcome to Social Media Trends on the weekend. All right, let's get right into it for stories that were trending on social media. Of course, I will start with my song of the week. This is no other than Burner Boy featuring J Balvin. Come on for the song Roller Coaster. Check out this visual. And honestly, how I wish I could take you into J Balvin's verse. It was fully in Spanish. We may not understand, but the flow was fantastic. Shout out to Burner Boy for that remix. It's amazing. And of course, his album is still making numbers right now worldwide. As you all know, he's an international Afrobeat superstar. All right, going into our next superstar for today, of course, David O. It's Aisha V here. Welcome to Social Media Trends on the Weekend Show. Now, of course, once I'm seated, there is something different about today's episode, of course, and I am wearing red. So we are obviously going to be speaking of Valentine's Day. It's all over social media right now, from different memes to storylines to skits from our skit makers. It's been a very, very hectic week with so many reminders of love, friendship, and of course, people that are getting served breakfast. <laughs> All right, speaking of breakfast, I have a short clip to show you on the artist, the American artist Post Malone, who took a performance of his song titled Fall Apart. Fans were wondering what's really going on, so I decided to make that my song of the week or the video of the week. Take a look at this video briefly. Still on artists for the week, of course, like Mr. Andy had mentioned, the South African rapper, AKA, was allegedly shot dead in Florida, in South Africa. I mean, it's terrible news. And here we are celebrating love and family and friendship. And then uh, there's a lot going on on social media this week. That's why I decided to make sure we understand the significance behind Valentine's Day. So going to be introducing a guest, uh, our very own, uh, one of our grassroots artists here in Abuja. He'll be sharing with us his ideas and so far his body of work. Uh, tell me about your genre of music. You know, you've been making music for a while now. Now you have your EP, which we also discussed. But tell me about your genre of music and what motivates you. All right. Um, my genre of music um, is um, Afro-pop. Yeah. And uh, it's been smooth and rough, you know how it is when trying to push yourself to a certain standard. 
No, I've been 10 years in the music scene. 10 years, yeah. wow. So right then in Pahakot, I've been with Mr. Drill and Wakonzi those days. So it's been kind of rough and smooth. We keep pushing. We never relent no matter Indeed, what. Indeed, you keep pushing. Yeah. I love that. I mean, we check out your Instagram page. You have the song, the single titled Vibrate. Yeah, yeah. That's something you've been working on and you've been, you know, sharing with your fans, the title Vibrate. Tell me more about that particular project, Vibrate. Okay. Vibrate is, um, is a piece of expression. You know, trying to express myself and the lady. Oh, Should lady! Because they're always thinking no, about I'm, ladies. I'm, I'm, I'm the man for the girls, them. So I like, I like the ladies a lot, and I have respect for them. A beautiful morning to our viewers across the world. It's Ayo Adams on the sports segment of the weekend show. And it's been an exciting week of transfer window football, players moving from side to side and players moving across the world. But first of all, um, you know, let's go to the world of tennis. I'll give you a little bit of update before we join our guest in Lagos to discuss the transfer window. We'll start with the, um, with the third Grand Slam of the tennis season. Um, as it's three days, two days um, to start the 2023 tournament at the Wimbledon. Um, in England and it's been an exciting scene for some of the top seeds who are going to be participating in the third Grand Slam of the tennis season. Novak Djokovic, the four-time defending champion, where will begin his quest for third Grand Slam title this year as world number two. We'll be looking to battle some of the brilliant um, top seeds across the world. Carlos Alcaraz, who reclaimed top spot in ATP rankings with a victory at the Queen's Club Championship, is now the number one seed at the Wimbledon for the first time in his career. Igas Swiatek, the reigning number one um, seed of the ladies' bracket, will also be on grass at the All England Club and has given her problems in the past. She has never advanced beyond the fourth round in the three uh, the championship that she has played in, while defending ladies champion Elena, Elena Rabakina is the third seed to start in this year's tournament with 2023 Australian Open Arena Sabalenka in world number two. So we're back to playing club football. There's a lot of you know club football going on this weekend. We have Manchester City playing Liverpool in a contest that you know to see who is going to run down uh, for the end of the Premier League. We have PSG playing Lyon. We have the, the Classica. Uh, in Germany, Bundesliga, where Thomas Tuchel will take the reins of the mantle of leadership for Bayern Munich for the very first time against his former club. There's a lot of magnificent football going on across the world. And I mean, also, we have tennis finals that is also going to be played and some other major news across there. But we'll start with our very first story. Um, we'll go straight to Italy, um, to Napoli. Upon return to Naples after representing his country in a two-legged Afghan qualifiers against Guinea-Bissau, Victor Osime was reported to have picked up an adductor strain injury, which we'll see him sideline for close to two crucial matches, starting with a weekend encounter with defending champions AC Milan at the Diego Maradona Stadium on Sunday night. Uh, let's talk about Next Gen. What do, who are Next Gen? What do they do? And how have they been able to, you know, be on the map of African grassroots football development? So actually, Next Gen started all the way back in Southampton, um, in the United Kingdom. So I studied football studies. Um, mm. One of the few people, or actually I believe I'm the first person actually in Nigeria with that degree. So basically, we are more of a, we started off as a scouting platform, yeah. looking at undiscovered talents back in the UK. Then we realized that, of course, obviously I'm from Nigeria, so I was like, it has to come back like to the motherland. Yeah. So basically, since when we started, I've worked with over six to seven players, the likes of Ibrahim Said, yeah. To Lou, Tunde, Akonsola, and actually foreign players, one from Saudi Arabia, then one from Yemen, then another one that plays for the England B team. All right. So, like that sea level over okay. there. I believe Newcastle will be part of it too. Arsenal, they are going to make the top four because it is quite obvious that they are obviously going for the Premier League and it's like impossible for them to drop off the top four at this moment. And Man City, they are also catching up with them and they are trying to make the top four as well. So, Man United too, I believe will make the top four because they are playing very well. They are very, very defensive. Number one, Nama City. Number two, na Arsenal. Number three, na Mayu. Number four, na Newcastle. Ah. Man City, now one party will be safe. Many beasts today, dear. It's like we get someone like the broom. They can't go buy a land again, no be easy thing. That go machine, we go go for them. And number two, again, that ass now, it goes still flop. You get Liverpool for front, you get Chelsea for front. You still even get Man City for front, so you won't play with. And Man City go beat them. My lovely audience all across the world, my name is Emeka Ozunoma. This is your Poetic Intel on the Weekend Show. And today I'm going to be um, doing a piece I title Treasure Island. Now, I wonder why we're walking this bitter road to enslaving our people. The air we breathe is slaved, 
and a very bitter digest in this debtor's dyspepsia. Nigeria is different kinds of treasures to different kinds of people. To the vulcanizer on the hot streets, almost scaled in from 200 degree Fahrenheit, scorched in this stressful assumption of anything called the national or subnational, feeding the ghost of an apparition in abysmal circumlocution. To the woman selling Akara at the juncture, how sweet is Nigeria to her? Nigeria was only bitter then, stripped of hope, of a life of beneficial guidance by good governance and functional economic policies, without bunkering a treasure from the miscegenation of misleading misgovernance. And one market woman's roof was leaking and inundated. Unwanted water crept in, harsh waters from the sky's nimbus, whiplashing the skin. But she must take it with a contrite heart, right? It's good that government is frugal only to the people, but extravagant to themselves, by acquiring all the riches of the land only themselves, only accruing wealth and riches for their personal and private enfranchisement. Nigeria is only sweet to a politician who owns bullion vans, where he loots his political treasures. So politicians were gathered as heavenly bodies. They were floating merrily in the Milky Way. The sun was a president, the moon was a vice president, and the stars were legislators and lawmakers. And soon, they were engrossed in their extraterrestrial politics, and they decided their separation of power. And soon, each came with their destructive heralds. We're staring at a son who only believed in nepotism, a brash personality you can never look in the eyes, a personality with high-handedness in a hubris high horse, burning humans with his suppressive enigma, and finally, without a trace, he disappears and appears in another continent with all his looted funds and basks in the glory of another climate. But the people he left behind when he darkened his days were stranded in penury and mass poverty. The people he left behind were dying in poverty, but he was cruising in Bentleys and Aston Martins. He was far from the wild bushfire he had constructed. And sometimes, indeed, the sun is very harsh as a politician and he gives men less than the sum of their labors, and he has no respite upon the epidemis, and soon the sun hands over power to the moon, and again their democracy absolves into the spiritual. They have no concrete proof of good governance. My people have no potable water, and if I voice out this humiliation, I'll be considered a rebel. It's all antiques for proscribing the truth and spreading falsehood through adulterated indoctrination. Sometimes, you say education is bad, but you're educated. That time education wasn't bad to you, or was it? You infringe us from access to truth and development. You make us live in deliriums of our sanity. But you are not as the rebels that you claim. We're not playthings to your political fiasco. If I say increase minimum... Good afternoon, my people. It's your main man, MC Sam. I just want to go around and ask my fellow Nigerians how they rate the performance of their president, Bola Ahmed Tunubu. It's just two months, about two months in his office. I just as I rate my fashion designer, Sammy Texas handwork, let me go around and ask my Nigerians how they rate the performance of Bola Ahmed Tunubu, our president. How do you rate the performance of our president, Bola Ahmed Tunubu? Uh, actually, I can say uh, Tunubu is trying. I would like Mr. President to focus on two areas. One is security, because security is very essential. It's where people, our, our life of Nigeria is at the risk. Every day we are losing a lot of these people, killing by bandits, arm or whatever. So uh, as a concerned citizen, I would like my president to focus on security areas. Secondly, it's an economic, because as a result of bad economies that we have in Nigeria, it leads us to a kind of action situation we find ourselves today. Unprecedented action. So, Mr. President, I would like you to focus on our this economy, particularly in our NERA. Our NERA has been devalued. Our currency has no value in the international market. As a result, so as a president, I would like you to focus on this to stay our NERA, to have more value in the international economy. That is my two areas that I would like Mr. President to focus on. President Muhammad Buhari has been in power since 2015 and would be handing over to a new president in the next um, couple of months. However, certain groups of people have come together to put together a compendium of his works and achievements. And so we will be analyzing the Mohammed Buhari and the Sibanjo administration to see its successes, its gaps, and what are the hopes for the future. Tell me why Nigerians should vote for Bola Metinib and Kashim Shetima in the, the next the, the evidence is there. And one of those things that it, if what we even exhibited here is part of it, 
they deceive from there, they will continue with it, and Nigeria will, go to, will be better for it. In a black and white, you know, definitions. This so is are, are you saying the APC has done so well in the past very well, eight years very that well, it deserves very well. to come back when to office? Of yes, course. Yes, of course, of course. Because when you meet the Nigerian situation in the first yes. place, we are not seeing things. The only thing Nigeria will celebrate is, is bad news. We don't celebrate good news. Do you think it's important to remove the fuel subsidy and what will be the impact on the country's finances? Well, I will mention what the economic theory says. And I will also mention what is applicable. Economic theory would say it's always good to remove subsidy. And in removing subsidy, you need to use the money or the funds to do other things. Now, that economic theory has assumed that we are living in a perfectly competitive market. It has also assumed that the forces of demand and supply will adjudicate price. Che, let me also explain this narrative. It is almost said by some persons that when we remove subsidy, it will affect the rich more than the poor. Mm. But do you know that is not very correct? Because economic is about relativism, not about absolutism. What it means is that if they remove subsidy, if government remove subsidy, which is good, but the condition, if I have time, I will tell you things that should be done, then we can talk about subsidy, but I need to be fine for everybody. Because of the danger it portends. If government says because you are rich, your, your average income is about 500,000, 1 million naira, and another person is poor, and is any less than 30,000 naira. You see, the proportion of increase on your income is relatively lower compared to the proportion of increase on a poor person. So if you increase by 5 naira, the poor man, the money he cannot, he, of course, he can't buy a vehicle. What he could do is to go by public transport. Perhaps public transport would increase it by 100%. You that can afford vehicle, that margin is very small as part of your income. So it is the pressure, the burden of subsidy removal that we measure. That is why when subsidy is removed, who goes to the street? Do you see big man on the street? You see poor people on the street because they would have been told the narrative. But when they understand the impact, you see them poor to the street. We cannot forget January 2012 when President Jonathan announced subsidy removal. What happened? So the implication... The impact is actually more on the poor. And that is why any government that removes subsidy hardly go back to office. Let's, um, we're talking about the way forward, but let's hear your thoughts on the recently completed um, presidential and gubernatorial elections in Nigeria, which we've had over the last couple of months. Well, um, <coughs> talking about um, elections in our country has always been uh, a very complicated issue. Because as a nation, we've been struggling with elections since 1964. And in spite of the changes that have taken place in terms of nomenclature, in the names of the electoral bodies, we don't seem to be getting out of the vicious cycle of electoral problems, organization of elections in our country. In 1958, we had the Election Commission of Nigeria. That was the one the British set up to organize the independence election, which went fairly well because the British were in charge. There were issues in terms of the size of regions and balance of power, but the election itself uh, wasn't a major issue. But in 1960, the government of Nigeria formed the Federal Election Commission, which organized the 1964 to 1965 general election. And then the problem started. In this election, there are redeeming features. And that redeeming features is the employment of technology to reduce human influences and factors. And the employment of beavers, the bimodal um, voting accreditation system. Uh, uh, by uh, uh, those, that is a credible improvement. In the same, if you look at this election, the numbers have come down. The bogus numbers you used to see mm. have come down. Where well, one state will announce two, three, four million. We didn't see it in this election because ghosts cannot be photographed. So in this election, we can be sure that only human beings voted. But then the management of the election. You now have the human factors. You undertake an election like the presidential election. The uploading of the results from polling units was somewhat delayed, raising suspicions about where were the results 
between the time of voting and when they were announced. But over and above this, ruling parties find it difficult to leave power. And so long as ANEC or electoral commissions remain in the hands of ruling parties, we will never have free and fair election in Nigeria. And so my thinking, and this is the, one of the prime reasons why I came on this program, not just complaining about what has happened. Now, with the change of nomenclature of INEC from EC, Election Commission of Nigeria, up to this one now, changing nomenclature will not give us free and fair lecture. Appointing the best people in the world in an electoral commission controlled by the executive arm of government will not give us free and fair election because of the way we are. In the United States, there's no federal electoral commission. In state governments, a state, that organ a state electoral commission that organize presidential elections according to their rules. But if you ask state government to organize the election here from what we have seen in the local government election, it will be far much worse. In fact, there will be no election. So what I, my mind is telling me, because as a citizen, I feel frustrated mm. that our country can't make it. Why? A brilliant country, a great country, you know, with all the manpower, with all the knowledge reservoir that we have with all the brilliance that our people show all over the world, we can't simply organize a free and fair election. It's a shame. So what do we do? It's a challenge for both the political class, for the media, for every citizen of Nigeria. And my suggestion is we should take INE completely out of executive arm of government control. Finally, before the deadline, the Chief of Staff to the President submitted the list of 28 people nominated to be ministers in President Bola Ahmed Tinubu's cabinet. We understand that this may be one of two lists. However, interesting to note that the list comprises of 25% women, which is a huge increase from what we've had in the recent past. We also have four former governors and three currently serving legislators. Remember, the president can show his cabinet at any point in time. So if you give me a list and say X, Y will be in charge of petroleum, and I decide to interrogate him based on that uh, uh, list, and after six months you change him to women affairs, I didn't interrogate him on women affairs. So mostly speaking, I don't think uh, it's a yastic. What, what we're looking at is, is this person competent? The Minister of the Federal Republic of Nigeria should be capable in serving the nation in that capacity of a minister. Portfolio is subjectively objective. Objective to the president that he want X to serve in Y ministry. And then, of course, uh, subjective to Nigeria is in the way you feel like uh, A may be better because the professor might be better in, uh, in the educational sector. Uh, so that's why I say it's subjectively objective. So we cannot crucify the president for not providing portfolio attached to the name, names are submitted to the, to, the, to the Senate for screening. That's a constitutional requirement. 60 days. The president acted within the provision of the constitution. The issue cannot be discussed. You cannot disparagate the president because he's bringing the list within the stipulated date that the constitution specifies. An act specify bring your list within 60 days. The president did that. There are procedures and processes by which ministers are selected. State involvement, you know, domestic socialization of the environment to ensure that the appropriate person emerge at the state level. Security clearance of people that are selected. This, you can't do this in two, three days. Now, coming to his statistics, he said that uh, Obasanjo did that in eight days. Well, that's good. But you look at democratic government from Obasanjo day to the present day. Why didn't you do that in seven months? Why did not submit any list to Senate up to seven months after I was president? And that is the reason why the Senate decided to make that law, that law that you must submit within 60 days. We will be having a one-on-one -on -one exclusive with Senator Garibat Musa Maidoki, the senator in the 10th um, National Assembly, on his role in the National Assembly and his plans for the people. It's a pleasure having you, Senator, and welcome to the weekend show. Thank you very much. But it's not about me, it's about our people. We had several discussions on this issue, and we had our ideas of how this issue should go, and we had our disagreement. Principally, 
from anywhere you look from uh, at our senatorial district. I know a senator is not an executive. He cannot execute a project, but he can propose. From anywhere you are going to KB South, there is no, the roads that were existing pre-1960 have completely disappeared. A 100 kilometer journey from Kwantagora to Zuru will take you five hours. And then if you come back with your car, only God knows the bill that you are going to pay for maintenance. The Zamfara state government had made tremendous progress to make roads right from Zamfara up to the uh, boundary between Zamfara and KB State. And he stopped at KB State. A 50 kilometer journey that is now covering the inside KB State that we had hoped either our governor or the federal government will complete so that we can be accessible. That 50 stretch take three hours. 50 kilometers.